about Acts, the book of Acts today. Acts is written by Luke, and it's an attempt to tell the history, or some of the history, of the early church. Um, after Jesus has gone back to heaven and um, the disciples are left alone, and they have this overwhelming desire to tell the story. And so this is about how that story got spread. Um, the part we're going to read today focuses in on Paul. And Paul has been chased out of Thessalonica and then out of Berea. And he is now in Athens. And when he left suddenly Berea, he left Silas and Timothy behind. So he's in Athens waiting uh, for them to catch up to him. I'm going to start reading. This is chapter 17. I'm going to start reading at verse 16 to give you a, a little more of a lead up. And then reading uh, to verse 31. So listen, friends, for the word of the Lord. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate, debate with him, and some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? And others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And then they took him and brought him to a meeting at the Areopagus. Why can't I say that? That's interesting. Um, actually, if we translate it into Latin and then we translate it into English, it's just Mars Hill, um, Areopagus, um, Ares being the god of war in, in Greece, right? Mars being the god of war in Rome, so Areopagus. Um, where they said to him, "May we know that this new what, may we know what this new preaching is that you were pre presenting." You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you were ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. And God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from any of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image made by human design and skill. For the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man whom he has appointed, 
He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. All right. So I used to teach philosophy in college. And if you want to teach anything much to 20-year-olds in this day and age, you have to grab their attention. Um, students have been conditioned by TikTok and Twitter to have very short attention spans. And so you got to grab them fast and you got to grab them hard. And they really don't want to hear about what somebody said 2,000 years ago. They find that totally irrelevant to their lives. So when I used to teach philosophy, and it was a, a general survey course, so I did teach those ancient Greeks, right? Um, I would say to them, okay, so we're gonna do a little experiment. And we did these ethical experiments all through the course. So today, you live in Europe during World War II, and you were hiding Jews in your basement because you're trying to be a good person and the Nazis are persecuting. They are grabbing up, transporting by train, torturing, starving, killing Jews and homosexuals and others who are different from their norm. So you're hiding Jews in your basement and one day, knock, 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 you open the door and it's the Gestapo, right? And they say to you, we've heard that you're hiding people in your basement. Are you hiding Jews and other the people in your basement? Now you're a Christian and these people are Jews and homosexuals and you don't approve of that and You've been brought up to tell the truth. So my question for today is, which is the ethical position you would take? Would you lie and say, oh heavens no, I'm hiding nobody? Or would you tell the truth? Because truth is fundamental, it's important and say, oh my goodness, I am. They're not like us anyway, right? I will tell the truth. So if you, if you would lie, go stand on this side of the room, and if you would tell the truth, go stand on this side of the room. And I realize this isn't your position for all time, but right now, make a choice. You have to make a choice and go move. And so that would get them up and moving and that helps keep college students engaged if they can do it with something physical. And we would do that kind of thing all through the philosophy class. Ethical questions. Right now, this very moment in your life, would you, do you think you would choose this ethical position or that one? Because ethics is frequently not really a choice between bad and good but a choice between something that appears good and something else that appears good. And you have to think deep enough to figure out which is the better good. So Paul too, as he comes to these people in Athens, these philosophers who gather around the Areopagus. I don't know why I cannot say that word. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Okay. Um, gathers around these people and he tries to meet them where they are. And he doesn't start by condemning them. Actually, he does a little of that in Romans. But here in Acts, he doesn't start by saying, you worship idols, you horrible people. He says, I see that you're very religious. And he moves on from there. I saw, a, it was probably a TikTok, the other day. It was Neil deGrasse Tyson. You probably know him. He's an astrophysicist of some note. Um, he's on television a lot. And he was saying, 
I think that there's something different today about the way that people interact with something they find new or they don't understand. He said, used to, if I was teaching or lecturing and I, I would put out my ideas there and some people would disagree with me, they'd come up afterwards and they'd say, well, you know, I heard what you said, but why do you think that? And we'd talk a little bit, and then they would say, well, you know, I think this. And then usually we'd talk a little bit more, and, and then we'd go get coffee, and we'd keep talking about the idea and try to figure out, you know, what was going on with it. He said, but today, when I say something on social media, which is, you know, the platform that everybody uses, right? The first thing that happens is people start condemning and attacking they don't say, let me understand why you say this. They say, you're wrong. And they try to get me or anybody else to conform to their idea. Attack, attack, attack. Paul, Paul doesn't do that. He says, I see you are very religious people. And I, I saw over here, actually, you had a little kind of a thing, and it said to an unknown God. And if you're already worshiping an unknown God, let me tell you a little bit about that unknown God, that God you don't know about. Let me tell you a little bit about that. And he begins to talk about Jesus and, well, Paul is an interesting one to talk about Jesus, because you remember early in his career as a Pharisee, he was going out and rounding up those people who believed in Jesus, and they called it the way, who followed the way, Jews who followed the way, he felt like they were following the wrong way. And he was going out and bringing them in in chains so they could be punished for thinking the wrong things. And then, of course, he sort of met God on uh, the road to Damascus. And he changed his ideas. He talks about repentance in this passage. It says, you know, God has allowed people to think all the different kind of things they want to think, but now there's a call to repent. And a lot of times we think about that word meaning to be sorry for your sins, and, and it does mean that. But the word fundamentally comes from a word to change direction, to rethink your ideas. And at the heart, God's call is to rethink some of the things that we've been thinking. You know, one of the things about Presbyterians is we believe in changing our minds, you know. We believe that we don't always get it right the first time or the tenth time. Our motto is reformed and always reforming. You know, we, we change when we discover that perhaps we haven't been thinking this deeply enough. And I think there's a call to Christians these days to think about the God of creation and to repent to rethink some of the positions that we have. I um, I taught in a church in Oklahoma. I preached in a church in Oklahoma. I also taught. Um, and after a Sunday school lesson, one Sunday, one of my, I would say elderly, except that she was probably in her late 70s and I'm pushing that direction myself, so I, I don't like elderly so much anymore. Uh, but one of my older members came up to me and she said, Susan, Judy, I hear what you say about God and God's love and God's love being for everybody and that Jesus did in fact, I, I see in scripture that Jesus did in fact talk to the outcasts, talk to those on the margins, talk to people who weren't accepted or acceptable. I, I see that, and I hear what you're saying. She said, but Judy, for 
70 years the church has taught me that certain kinds of people are sinful and, and are going to hell. They, they can't be saved. Why should you be right? And all those other years, 70 years of church teachings that I heard in the churches I went to, Presbyterian churches that I went to, how come they're all wrong and I should believe that you're right? Well, you know, I don't have the answer to that. Um, why you should believe me as opposed to somebody else. But I ask you, I think the call, well, the call is to dig deeply into the story of Jesus and to allow that story to shape how you think about God and how we think about each other. Because the Creator God has given us wonderful gifts, right? And sometimes what we do with those gifts is we, we idolize them instead of just appreciating them. There's a difference. We live in a kind of a consumerist society, right? I mean, all those commercials, no matter what you look at. If you're on Facebook, they're commercials. If you're on um, TikTok, even their commercials. Lots of commercials to buy things. And sometimes buying things and having things gives us a sense of fulfillment. Things sometimes can do that. You know, you look at this table we have set today and the beauty of the silver there and the, um, the sweetness of the pottery and the flowers and the candle and the, the cloth, <coughs> that all helps with our perception of the majesty and mystery of communion. Things can be very beneficial. The fact that Jesus became a human being and lived in this world hallows or makes sacred all of space and all of time and all of matter. The beauty, the beauty of things. And, and, and so sometimes we like, and if we can afford it, and sometimes maybe if we can't, we like to buy things. We all like things, some of us more than others. Consumerism, however, can be an idolatry. If, in fact, we buy things so that we feel, feel fulfilled and whole, then we put that as the thing we worship rather than God helping us to feel fulfilled and whole and worthwhile. Paul says, God, in God we move and live and have our being. Actually, it was a Stoic philosopher that said that first, about 600 BC. Um, that's another place where Paul is meeting the Stoics where they are, right? He uses their own philosophical ideas because that's an important Christian idea. The 20th century Paul Tillich will say, God is the ground of being. It is God that keeps us, keeps us in being. But if we depend on things rather than on God, then we have made an idol out of those things. The same thing is true with so many things in, in our culture. We all want to feel safe. We want our families to feel safe. We want our loved ones to feel safe. We want our country to feel safe. And yet if we take a step beyond that and we say, therefore, then I need all the weapons in the world in my house. I need to be able to shoot lots of bullets really fast to keep my family safe. You know, I grew up in a hunting household. 
I, I can't even remember the first time I went out to a shooting range. I was really little. But I won't have a gun in my house nowadays because it's different. It's different. I know the difference between a 22 and a 30 out 6, but an AK-15 is meant to murder people, to kill in war. It's not meant to hunt. You don't shred deer with bullets. Unless you're some kind of psychopath. We need to look deep <coughs> theologically and know that our safety ultimately depends on God and God's good gifts to the world and God's grace for the world and on each other. That being one of God's good gifts, right? But it never, it does not depend on violence. We call it the, the myth of redemptive violence. And it's in every damn superhero movie. I've gotten to the point in my life when I, I, I used to love Marvel, love comics. I lived next door to one of those guys one time when I lived in California. It was cool. I used to love superheroes. But now when I see them, all I see is the violence that they are doing. And we want them to win. We believe in justice. And we want justice no matter how much of New York or London you have to tear up to get it, right? And I know it's just fiction. But it perpetuates that myth that the way that you stay safe is to kill the ones that you think that you think are making you unsafe. We need to learn to think deeply, deeply theologically about where we put our trust. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus. You know, sometimes they're just God things. I didn't know we were seeing that because I actually didn't look at the liturgy. But that's what this is about. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, to trust in God. Ultimately, we have to say, I cannot make the world safe. I cannot save the world. What I can do is cooperate with the work that God has started and that God calls us to do, calls the church to do, calls Christians to do, calls everybody to do the work of caring. Uh, one of the things I loved, uh, I don't know if it was last week maybe, um, Brian talked about that Margaret Mead story. You know, where somebody asked Margaret Mead, what was the first sign of civilization? Probably expecting, you know, certain kind of building or certain kind of metal using or something like that, right? But Margaret Mead said, the first sign of civilization that I've ever seen was a 15,000 year old femur that had healed. Femur bone had been broken, but the person didn't die of that. Somebody, not just somebody, some bodies in their community kept them alive long enough to heal. That means somebody was caring for them. Somebody was making sure they got food and water because Femurs take weeks and weeks to heal. Somebody was also doing their job in the community, whatever that was, if they were a hunter or a gatherer or whatever, and making sure that they got what they needed even though they were sick and couldn't help. And that, Margaret Mead said, is civilization. When you take care of the weak, among you simply because they are part of you. Paul says, God allows us to worship how we want to, but God calls us in Jesus Christ to rethink, to rethink those things that are part of our world, part of our culture, and to live in a different way. Amen. Amen.
And so here we are at the table. It is not a Presbyterian table. It is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ bids us come and be fed. Be fed spiritually. For in this food, God makes us more like Christ. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks, O God, for this table, for this nourishment, for the ways in which you have taught us your life through the poem of love that we can look at over and over again in order to learn how to live. We thank you for that great gift. We thank you for the spirit that binds us together in love, that teaches and collects us and holds us together. And we thank you for this meal that reminds us that in you we are fed. For man does not live by bread alone, but by words from God and by this great sacrament that offers us God's love and peace and forgiveness. Today we will be offering um, the Lord's Prayer by song. If you remember, we've done that a couple of months now. So um, if you want to sit, that's fine. Um, and if you can do that. And he 
and gave it to those who were with him, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if the servers would come forward. It is the custom here at this church to um, hold bread and then for us all to eat it together. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ given for you. And in the same way, he took the cup.
loving God as we have been nourished by this. Nourish our spirits and strengthen us that we might live more truly in the cross. Amen. Thank you.